Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. You know, from a marketing perspective, all of those things, um, they're helpful. And another piece is the public speaking. You know, and for me, you know, what I watch with my clients when they get out there, the, the exponential growth of how they are seen um, in the, you know, how they're seen in communities and, you know, through that outreach and what they're receiving back, you know, because of that outreach, it far outstrips um, writing blog posts and, you know, other, all the other marketing pieces that we can do because there is such this direct connection and we get to really see who that person actually is. Welcome back to another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. Now, if you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Pete Newell of BMNT and Simon Leslie of Inc. Global, both really worth listening to, as are all my episodes, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation. Now, I'm really excited again today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Janice Tomich. She's a communication specialist, speech writer and speaking skills development coach, and she's the founder and principal of Calculated Presentations. Janice works with clients to hone their public speaking skills and provides communication coaching to help leaders navigate difficult conversations and support their teams. She works with executives and professionals to help them have their voices heard and to drive change. Her perspective is driven by a deep belief that each of us, our individual thoughts, ideas and vision can make a difference. In our discussion today, Janice talked to me about developing presentation skills as an introvert. We talked about her framework for compelling, persuasive presentations and the importance of always making it about your audience. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Janice Tomich. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Vancouver in Canada, Janice Tomich, who's a communication specialist and founder and principal of Calculated Presentations. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Janice. It's a great privilege to have you here as my guest. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to be here. Now, Mariana Norton, who was our guest on episode 295 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we get you on the show and have a conversation. So a big shout out to Mariana. Yes. Thanks to Mariana. Now, you support individual clients and organizations to improve communication skills. And part of that is it delivering powerful presentations. So I'm really excited to dig into that today and particularly in this day and age where a lot of our presentations are being done online and how that might be different. So um, I'm really excited to dig into that. But before we dig into that, what inspired you to get into this communication space and teaching people to deliver compelling presentations? Well, it was a very long, windy road um, to getting here. And you know those diagrams that we often see of um, how, what people think it takes to get to, you know, whatever their goals mm. or objectives are, and it's, it's a straight upward linear, linear trend. <laughs> yeah. And then they show, you know, the other comic piece that's actually, you know, it swirls around and up and down. That was mine. <laughs> lots of lots of up and downs and swirling around. 
So uh, really, really Cole's notes version of um, I started working with my dad in my dad's business. Um, so, you know, that yeah, that and I think in itself is interesting, too, because um, all of the pieces, you know, that I've come to now being in business for myself, you know, um, and I have been in business for myself for 11 years. Um, the, all the pieces now are really fitting together very, very nicely. You know, so as I said, my dad really entrepreneurial and um, I worked with him in his machine shop in a non-traditional role on on his on a lathe on a production lathe um, from there um, i went into dentistry and i worked as a dental assistant then i worked as a dental technician i became allergic to um, the product that we were using methyl methacrylate which builds acrylic and then i decided to go back to school in my late 40s and i received a communication degree and a marketing degree and graduated in 2009. Um, economy wasn't great here in Canada and decided to open up my own business, a communications firm. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, timing is all everything there, isn't it? Sort of straight after the 2008 crash, and mm -hmm. um, it would have been a challenging time. I remember I started my business in 2007, so I was sort of just starting to gain some traction when the crash hit. So it certainly had a big impact. So what kind of lessons did you take out then? I mean, lathe operator in your dad's machine shop, sort of hard to imagine what that might, um, what that might teach you about communication skills later on, but I'm sure you saw a lot of things in terms of business mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship there. What, what type of lessons did you take out of that and out of your roles in the, in the dental industry? Um, working with my dad in the machine shop, first of all, being on the lathe, um, the consistency, right? The, you know, the consistent effort to then take you to, you know, successful output, but also to watch my dad, um, you know, for a number of years and, you know, through my entire life, my dad has always been self-employed and not all, not always in the machine shop in many other capacities and watching his flexibility, um, you know, to, um, be able to move really quickly to market needs um, and to also to watch him Well, I looked at him and and I'm sure that there were nights that he was sleepless right you know with anxiety mm. what you know with whatever whatever was going on but we didn't see it you know I saw somebody who was um, kind of fearless and you know seemed to be um, be very comfortable you know with changing landscape all of the time so yeah, so you know that was a really good foundation and you know background for me to, in the end, have a business on my own. Working in the dental field, um, I worked in a few different um, clinics, but um, majority of time I was in one large um, clinical practice that had a number of um, satellite stations all around here in the Lower Mainland. Wonderful, um, the founders of that practice had fantastic business acumen, and. Um, a lot of it just you know a lot of it you know was after in hindsight but to watch them um, grow and build these practices just really astute you know sound business practice it was a really gift a really big gift to watch you know what they had grown hmm. all right so tell us a little bit then about what you do today how you help your clients and and what some of the big challenges are that you help people deal with i get to do something really really cool because um, I'm, I tend to be introverted. I'm, I'm, can be a bit on the quieter side, and so I get to be behind the scenes and support people from the um, delivering communication. So you know that can be a number of things. Um, so all communication pieces. So whether it's you know delivering a presentation on stage, which wouldn't be happening now because now we've moved things over to online, to communication, um, you know, within offices. You know anything from board meetings to you know face-to-face -face meetings um so it, my work encompasses all of that hmm. i'm curious how how does an introvert decide that uh, public speaking and communication and uh, that involves interacting with people a lot mm -hmm. is is something that you chose to pursue as a business and as a passion yeah, um, a bit. Of, yeah, it's a bit of a story. Um, and and I think, as you know, that introverts, you know, when you're introverted, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're shy. Um, and 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 I'm not. I wouldn't say that I am. 
I'm very curious and I really like to meet people. Um, however, um, a lot of that I find um, tiring, tiring for me. And whereas, whereas um, somebody who's an extrovert, um, they're quite different and, and they feed off of it. Um, what I will say, um, going so I returned to academia um, quite late in life and um, was terrified of public speaking and know that I had to wrap my head around it and get you know much better at it. So I challenged, just challenged myself constantly to get to become a better public speaker. And um, no, it wasn't pretty at first. <laughs> it, took, <laughs> it, it took me, it took me a while, but you know, I was the one, I would always put my hand up and volunteer for any public speaking event because I was bound and determined that I was going to get better at it. While I was going, um, while I was back at university, a colleague of mine um, who is a partner in a large firm in Europe, um, we had some chats and he said, you know, really think about the communication piece, you know, when you graduate and, you know, as far as the public speaking perspective, um, he said, I have, a, he was in mergers and acquisitions at the time. And he says, I have a lot of um, people coming to me, you know, wanting to sell, you know, their, their company. And he said, they're very poor presenters oftentimes, um, which oftentimes for me, I send them away and, you know, they don't, we, we don't acquire them because of how mm. poor presenters they are. Um, so give that some thought. So, you know, him and I had lots of discussions around that and at post-graduation 2009 calculator presentations was born. Hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating. And uh, just coming back to the introvert question, I mean, I'm, I'm an introvert as well. And here I am talking to, yeah people all around the world on a podcast for uh, long periods of time and getting to meet lots of interesting people. But it's, as you say, um, I have weeks where I do five or six podcasts and maybe in these days have another couple of Zoom meetings. And then at the end of that week, I'm totally exhausted. And um, a few times I, I thought, why am I so tired? I haven't physically done anything, but it's really just that need to... Yeah go inside and go into your own space and and yeah. and recharge which is yeah. the introverts thing whereas the extrovert would be would be feeling very very tired if they were alone yes. <laughs> for a yeah. long period of time they would they get their energy from interacting with people yeah yes absolutely so and me um you know i did you know um gain my chops you know along the way through academia and became really good at the public speaking and really enjoyed it um and still do you know I, I really love that ability to connect with others and share what i know and however you know i i book time off after i've been speaking at an mm. event because just as you said i'm tired after yeah not mm. physically tired brain tired and i yeah, do need yeah. to recharge mm. Okay, um, I wanted to. I'll come back in a moment to the fear of public speaking because I know you know you've probably got lots of insights there. Or how do you how you manage that yourself? And I love that you you know you decided to just confront it and do it because I you know people ask me all the time about podcasting as well, and I say well, and you know I get compliments and they say I could never do that, and I say well you should listen to some of my first episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty ordinary, so it really just is a case of practicing and and being alert as to where you can improve and i'm still yeah. looking to improve all the time and so you just keep um, keep learning new things and moving forward so we'll touch on that in a moment what i did want to pursue a little bit now was the idea of presentation skills and you mentioned something there you know people are pitching all the time so they're pitching in your example the sale of a company to somebody who is a potential purchase or broker. And if the presentation is bad, then they get rejected. And that is probably independent of the quality of the project itself. And I know I had an example recently where people pitched to me all the time to come on the show. And this was actually an agency that was pitching on behalf of a client and they sent me such a poor pitch. Um, it was templated. The template was really bad, um, but apart from that, they didn't even bother to change the um, the copy that they'd uh, inserted, you know, the last person's name and the last person's podcast name in there. They'd copied that over, and I, I thought, 
and I did look at the guests that they suggested because I was curious and I thought, wow, that person would be really interesting to have on the podcast. But the pitch was so bad, the presentation was so bad that I would have ignored it. Um, so as it was, I, there was, there's another story to go behind that. But yeah, talk to us about why everybody should be paying attention to kind of communication skills and in terms of when they are making a pitch to somebody and we do it all the time, whether we're selling, whether we're presenting an idea, whether we're um, doing a workshop or webinar. Mm -hmm. Well, you really hit the nail on the head, you know, didn't you? And, and you know, it's funny as you said that I was thinking back to my first class, first semester returning to university professor walks in and says, if you take anything out of this communication degree, remember, it's always about your audience. It's not about you. And you, you know, you absolutely nailed it because that's where it is. And this is where presentations fail. You know, we think that, um, well, will we, will we have, you know, this information that we want to share, but it becomes very me centered and me centered and I centered, um, that doesn't work, right? It has to be, it has to be audience focused just as your podcast is audience focused, right? Hmm. Yeah, that is. And, you know, to me, that's the big thing. And um, particularly, so coming back to the fear of public speaking, I mean, I, I get nervous when I speak in public, I get nervous when I come on this podcast. Um, but it's not a fear as such of doing it where I'd say, Oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. It's a nervousness around because I really care about making it great for the audience. And, and so that's the nerves. But I think maybe thinking back to the time when I did have a fear and I would think about, well, I've got something to share that mm -hmm. I think is going to help the audience. And if you focus on, yes. you know, I've got to do a good job for the audience. I've got to get my message across because this message is going to help them do something. Yes. Um, is that your approach? Yes. To yes, absolutely. So, and so it's reframing as well. And you touched on that, you know, what you've just shared now. Um, so I don't, and even for me, I was a little bit nervous to come on today. Right. And of course we all are because, you know, we, we care about, um, you know, that we are sharing, you know, to the best of our abilities, um, you know, to others. And, um, and of course, you know, I have to take myself through all of the techniques that I take my clients through, you know, it, it's no different. And one of them, as I said, it's reframing, it's flipping, um, you know, rather than hearing that chatter in my head saying, oh, you know, you're going to bomb or it's, you know, it's not going to be great or whatever it is. It's no, um, I'm curious, you know, I'm excited. Um, so, it, and, you know, physically there's a whole change throughout your body when you can change your mindset, you know, in that manner. Mm. Yeah, that's, that certainly I think is, is one of the biggest learnings for me is that if you change your mindset like that, that it actually has an impact on your, your physical body, like, you know, sweaty palms go away and you can actually calm the breathing down a little bit. So, yes. Mm. Yeah. And that, and that's part of it as well. It's the, to be able to deregulate it to de like regulate any anxiety or nerves um, through breath, breath control. Um, and that's a lot of the work that I do with clients as well. So I'll share a little trick with you. Um, take in taking the deep breath, as long as the, um, the exhale is longer, that will lower your heart rate. Um, and it's something that I've known for a long time, you know, through the research that I've done, but I just received a Fitbit as a present. And so I've been, I've mm -hmm. been doing it and, you know, Brilliant. watching myself. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, I've got the conclusive evidence on my arm. It actually works. Right. Okay. I'll have to remember that. Yeah, so I, I have, um, in the past, I've been on, um, bike tours. I mentioned before we started mm -hmm. recording that. Um, I, I like to go out biking and I've been on tours where I've had, you know, a long climb up a hill and been quite strenuous. And I, I do watch my heart rate occasionally, particularly in those sort of situations. And I think, wow, the heart rate's really high now. I've still got a long way to go. I better conserve some energy here. So um, I, I will actually will my heart rate down. And I guess maybe I'm unconsciously doing that sort of breathing because 
if I think and concentrate on get that heart rate down, even without kind of lowering the energy that I, the energy input. So I do lower the energy input some, but it's not as if I just stop. And and so the heart rate does actually come down. Yeah, yeah, it does. I'll have, to, I'll have to focus on the breathing next time. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of work around, um, you know, breath work and breath regulation, and probably especially the past couple of years, um, which has been fascinating. But um, I think the best piece of all is that it does work. Hmm. Okay. Now, in terms of presentations in general, so whether that's a speech that you're presenting or whether it's a a pitch for presenting a speech, because I think there's there's um, you know, there's a question around how do you get attention for a speech that you'd like to give when um, you know you're competing with other people to go onto that platform, um, or it's a presentation to make a sale of a company, like you, the example you gave earlier. How how do you kind of approach that presentation and prepare for it so that it's actually persuasive and and addresses the needs of your audience? Yeah, um, you know, and it's funny, I'm working with um, a group right now, and and this is what they came forward to be with, and um, so it's an executive group, and um, I was contact, contacted by the board, and so they wanted me to, you know, we are, and they wanted me to work with this board, and the biggest piece was around, it's around, it was about what they wanted what they wanted from the what they want from the executive suite is to be open and vulnerable and i know that mm-hmm. probably sounds weird but they just want them to be themselves and they don't want this veil they they don't want this veil of professionalism to hang in between the communication the speakers that i see on stages i, I would say the same thing And just like you and I talking today, right? You know, it's just a natural conversation um, in confidence, with confidence, you know, of what we know. And it's those that can stand up there humbly, um, just as themselves are the ones that that have the best ability to be able to connect with others. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I I find like taking the podcast as an example, I find it reasonably easy to get on like we are now and have a conversation with somebody. I mean, mm-hmm. it's helpful if you've done preparation beforehand, if you know, you know, what, what, what is that person interested in? What does that person know a lot about? And what are the kind of topics that, you know, they'll get excited about if I prompt them to tell me more about that. So that certainly helps. Where I struggle sometimes is if I'm doing particularly online where I have no feedback at all if I'm doing a solo video recording a video of just me presenting something or if I'm doing a solo podcast which I also do uh, I find that a lot more challenging so how do you how do you show up in those environments as yourself as if you're having a conversation with someone else yeah that that's tougher right you know so imagination is involved there also um, some depth of research about who the audience is um, yeah. one of the tricks that I do and I recommend for my clients is to put I mean and and it sounds silly but it works is to put a picture mm. of somebody who yeah. you're actually speaking to up above the camera right and I hear you because you know it is dead air right mm. but um, you know we have to do you know tricks and techniques to be able to put ourselves into the headspace you know that we are just as genuine as we would be when we're talking um you know one to one or you know in a large group hmm. yes I, i've heard uh, i i have actually used the putting the picture behind the the camera <laughs> and uh, did it work? I guess, did it, work? Yeah, it does work it does work yeah it certainly i mean it takes you out of your head mm-hmm. and focuses back on that one audience and and particularly well if you are doing a video or a even more so a podcast because it is a very personal space so mm-hmm. people will have their headsets on and if um you know one of the tips around podcasting is that you actually speak to one audience member because there's exactly. only one person there on the end of the headsets and even though you might have um thousands of listeners it's it's one person who's listening at that given time yeah having one person as a photo there does help yeah 
Yeah, one person in your mind. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. And I'm also a big proponent of practice too. Um, and, you know, and I know it's really difficult for some people to, you know, take your ego out of the way, right, and watch that video or listen to that podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but it's such a fantastic learning tool, you know, if, if you can separate yourself and what did I learn from this? You know, what will I take away from next time? Mm -hmm. What can I improve on next time? What will I not do, you know, that next time? But, um, you know, pra that practice piece is, is so important. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's certainly something. And I think a lot of people are challenged by listening back to themselves, but uh, I've, I've gotten to the point where I can do it. Um, I have to sometimes speed up, uh, speed up the replays, but it certainly gives you lots of insight because you think, oh gosh, did I do that? Or did I say that? <laughs> hmm. Yeah. It provides lots of feedback for us. Yeah. The other thing, and I can't remember who, who gave me this uh, suggestion recently, and that was, um, oh, I think it was Lisa Monette um, mm -hmm. on a recent episode. She's a, she's a video confidence coach, and she suggested um, to, analogy to the Tom Hanks movie, um, what is it, um, where he's stranded on an island and he's got the basketball as his only friend, so he said, have a Wilson. <laughs> A Wilson, perfect. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and I can't remember the name of the movie either. It escapes me too. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Castaway. That's it. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, now, so landing speaking gigs. So if you if you are aiming to get speaking gigs, say at a conference or a TED talk, for example, mm. um, what? What's your recommendation for going about landing that? Because, I mean, you've got to start with a presentation about why they should engage you as a speaker, right? Yeah, start with the presentation. It's not that you need a full on, you know, blown, you know, blown up that it's all, you know, everything's in play. But have a, a good idea, a good framework in mind so that you do know, um, you know, what it is that you're pitching. And again, you know, as we talked, talked about, um, even, you know, within if it was a TEDx, which is the subsidiary of the TED conferences, you know, they're always looking for different themes and whatnot. Um, every year, you know, TED has a different theme, um, different association events, you know, it's the same thing. So you need to be really cognizant of who you're pitching and, and, and you know, what it is that you're pitching. Um, it also takes tenacity um, mm. because if you're put off by the first no, you know, you'll, you, you'll never get anywhere. You have to be prepared um, for lots of no's and um, and also, you know, asking for feedback, you know, when you are receiving the no's, um, you know, which gives you really good fodder for moving ahead and how to approach things differently. If perhaps, you know, you're not approaching, you know, in the way that you'll get uptake. Mm. Yeah, well, there's a couple of really great bits of advice there is. And and I was speaking to somebody yesterday around the topic of sales and their recommendation was go for more no's, which mm -hmm. I, I think was his way of saying, just keep trying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Keep trying and, and yeah, set aside the fact that people are saying, no, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. And for, and for bigger events, you know, it's, it's a really long lead time, you know, because, mm. you know, and I know that we're in a different environment right now with COVID. But, um, you know, in, you know, um, times, you know, pre-COVID, usually conferences are, you know, they go from year to year and, you know, they, they choose their speakers, you know, probably eight, six months out. Um, and, and, you know, there's many conferences going on, right? So, you know, to acquire those gigs, you know, it does take a considerable amount of time, um, but, you know, you keep, you need to keep we keep things moving, keep the ball moving, right? So that you are acquiring and that you've got a constant number of gigs coming in. Mm. Yeah. So again, practicing and, and maybe starting with some smaller events where mm -hmm. there's not as high demand or you're not competing against people that are far more experienced or accomplished than mm -hmm. you might be at, at your journey, at your stage of your journey. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you're learning your, you know, you're learning your craft as you go um, and building your reputation and, you know, so, you know, founded on that, you know, you can move, you know, farther and farther, you know, up the chain of events. Mm. 
All right. Now, in terms of an important presentation or a speech that you're presenting, what's your approach? Do, do you script it out or not? Not. <laughs> Never. And uh, not what I recommend for my clients as well, because I come from the perspective of, you know, if we're speaking about something, we've got deep, you know, embedded knowledge about it, you know, usually years and years of knowledge and expertise. Um, and, you know, for sure, there is a framework, you know, around a presentation, but no bullet points and um, and then and speak to those bullet points, right, expand upon them. Um, you know, and as far as framework, you know, there's a traditional framework of, you know, moving into a presentation, the opening, you know, being able to engage people and pull them in, you know, right away, you know, get them interested right from the beginning. And for a presentation, you have a strong, um, a through line, right, a theme through it that will run all the way through the presentation, which then needs to be supported, um, it needs to be argued. And, and not in too many ways, because an audience can only take so many things in. So, it, you know, it's the rule of three or the rule of five, usually, usually three. And then you can expand off of those points. So, you know, that's what the, like a standard presentation would look like. And then you've got to, you've got to, you've got to finish um, powerfully, you know, so that you're inciting, you know, your audience to, to do something. So, you know, marketing terms of call to action of sorts, you know, whatever that looks like. Hmm. Okay. And in terms of, so you've got a framework or a bullet, bullet list of what you want to cover. So how, how do you internalize that? So particularly if you're on stage in front of an audience that you're not looking at notes or, or referring or reading the slides, which is probably one of the oh. worst things I would guess. That's the worst. That's horrible. It's <laughs> that the worst. certainly feels bad when I'm listening to somebody read yeah. the slides. Yeah, as are slides that are filled with text, right? That's mm. just that's just as egregious. Um, yeah, I use the technique for myself and and also with my clients that I teach my clients as well. And so I'm in my early 60s now, and I still like I have no problems, um, you know, learning those bullet points. Um, and what it is, it's through a visual cueing. When I practice here um, in my front room where I am today, for each bullet point. I allocate a piece of furniture. And so, and so that's how I'm able to memorize. Um, for some of my clients, it doesn't work. Um, they'll say to me, well, I can't imagine furniture when I'm up on the podium. Um, for them, um, what we do is body parts. So, you know, top of, top of the head, um, you know, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and so forth is allocated to each of those bullet points throughout the presentation. So that's how, um, I'm able to, and they're able to learn their presentations memorized, so to speak, but not really memorized. Mm. Yeah. So it's kind of a visual recall triggers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And yeah, using, using your own body parts is good because you've got that with you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> okay. And, and the use of slides, you talked about, you know, having lots of, text on slides is really bad so what what's your advice around use of slides i mean do you use them or not um and when you use them what's what's a good way to have them um help the presentation yeah and you made a really good point because we don't always need slides um and i think you know oftentimes it's that status quo and people think that well you know a presentation looks like this and i have to use slides we don't you know, often more effective is just that person being in front of us and, and sharing information in a persuasive and impactful way. However, um, you know, there are times that slides are wonderful and, you know, terrific means of support. And, you know, what, you know, especially the past, you know, four or five years, um, what is more um, commonplace and works really well is a slide for it to be just um, a very strong visual you know, that aligns with what the person is speaking to. Um, there may be a tag on it. There may be, you know, one or two points on it, you know, at the very maximum, but it shouldn't be any more than that. Um, and the theory around that, the reason for that is if it's the right visual, which I'm not seeing, you know, sometimes it takes mm. a long time to put a slide deck together and find just those right images, right? Those correct images. Um, when you can, um, then what happens is it, it triggers an emotion. 
um, in the person, in, in your audience, people that are listening, which then triggers a memory. Um, so, um, so you've got the wonderful opportunity then, you know, the person who has watched your presentation walks away, perhaps a couple of weeks later, and that image, you know, may flash in their mind, and they're going to remember um, then, you know, what you have said, you know, during your presentation. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. that. And and basically, you're using the same technique for that you use for memorizing the bullet points of your talk, the framework of your talk, to help the help the audience to recall key points of the presentation. That's right. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. You're right. You're absolutely right. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I sometimes I spend hours and hours doing a presentation, and the main, uh, the main time-consuming bit is, oh, where's a good photo that that's going to yeah. emphasize that point? Yeah, 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 and trigger you know what it yeah. is that you're speaking to. Yeah. yeah. So, it's... do you have any tricks for? sort of making that a more efficient process? No, <laughs> no, I haven't found it yet. Hmm. I'm the person that's often, you know, spending hours looking through image banks. Um, if someone knows, I would love to hear. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, I've, I'm challenging myself on my solo podcast where I tell stories and relate those stories back to a marketing lesson. And another, so that's kind of the framework of it. But another rule I, I've trying to implement there or I have implemented it with one exception is that the images I use are my own photographs but they uh. also they also need to highlight either sort of be related to the story or to the lesson yes. and I'm finding that quite challenging but it, uh, I'm, I'm starting to I've got thousands and thousands of my own photographs because I'm a keen photographer but I'm getting to the point now where i I'm starting to build a memory bank in my mind of, of the photos, you know, at the beginning, I'd go back to old photos and, oh, I'd forgotten I'd taken that. Um, but, but now I'm starting to remember all these photos that are years and years old, you know, 10, 20 years old sometimes. That are in the bank. So now do you find that when you go out and you're taking images, um, are you looking at it from the perspective of, um, you know, this, this might work well in this instance, um, you know, this concept around marketing, are are you do you have that insight mm. at all when you're taking photos? Not necessarily. I do see some things, yeah, that that I might not have photographed before, that that I might not have found interesting to compel me to just photograph it before. So I'll see something that triggers a thought around marketing and then and then, then I'll photograph it. So it's it's changed my approach there. Yeah. yeah, because you know when you go to, uh, are at a presentation, you know whether it is online or whether it is in person, um, those images that someone has clearly they've taken themselves, they just resonate so much more than stock photos, you know, that we get hmm. from you know plot, from image platforms. Yeah, yeah, that's right, because they're unique. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay, um, I did want to ask, you know, we've we. we touched a couple of times in the conversation so far on the situation we're in right now, the COVID pandemic and various stages of lockdowns, inability to have large gatherings and travel extensively. So most of the presentations now have moved online where people in the past have done a lot of presentations in person or speaking in person. So what kind of things do people need to consider when they're making that transition to online presentations? What's different about it and what what may someone have not confronted before if they haven't done lots of online presentations? Yeah, and and actually this is, you know, so this has been interesting the past couple or three months. Um, it's the clients that have been reaching out to me um, because they're used to, you know, and they're very comfortable with presenting um, on, um, in person on stages and whatnot, and now, um, you know, have to, you know, deliver online. And so there's a number of things, you know, to keep, to keep in mind. And one of them, it, it, the, it's funny, as you, as you said that, the first thing that, that comes to mind, it's, it's to look at that camera, right, mm. you know, for the most part. And it's one of the most difficult things, like I still struggle with it all the time. 
And, um, you know, we talked about putting a picture of someone up there, um, sometimes just a yellow sticky up there, because it really helps with that engagement piece, right? You know, and the person on, on the other end of that camera really feels, you know, as they're being, they're being spoken to. Also, talking on a um, meeting like this online, it can be a little bit flat, right? It's, you know, it's not quite, it doesn't have quite the same temperature as when we would meet in person. So it's really important to have lots of energy and, you know, be really enthusiastic and still um, have natural, you know, body language movements, you know, that we would have anyways. So you see me, you know, and I know that this is yeah. only audio, but, you know, you and I are talking, you know, through video. Um, I come from a French Canadian family, right? So there's lots of movement to the hands, yeah. right? And you've seen me, you know, that's just naturally mm. the way that I talk. And so it's important, right? You know, that you need to really look things up, you know, so because you've heard people speak who are very, you know, monotone, doesn't take very long, you know, before you pull back and you disengage. So it's really important that, you know, you stay engaged and, and connected throughout. Mm. And would you say, in an online world, it's important to perhaps exaggerate that because, I mean, that, that's been my experience. I listen back to some of my solo episodes and I um, do the redo the recording because when I listen back, I think, oh, that was really drab and silent. And yet it felt as though when I presented, it felt mm -hmm. as though I was kind of really full of energy and excited, but it seems to get leveled somehow. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, you need to really bump up the energy probably about 10 or 15% than you would usually do. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which feels a little unnatural. <laughs> it does. Um, but then, as you said, you know, when you listen back to your recordings, hmm. as you said, you realize that they're flat. Yeah. 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 That's certainly been my experience. All right. Um, now, I, we've talked about um, serving your audience and the servant leadership bit. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, people kind of say, well, it's not that important that I get out and speak or it's not that important that, you know, I hear a lot writing blog posts or why should I go on a podcast or why should I record videos? And, you know, I, I'll just rely on my website or perhaps social media stuff that I'm doing and people will find me and, come and engage with me and for sure you know from a marketing perspective all of those things um, they're helpful and another piece is the public speaking you know and for me you know what i watch with my clients when they get out there the the exponential growth of how they are seen um in the you know how they're seen in communities and you know, through that outreach and what they're receiving back, you know, because of that outreach, it far outstrips um, writing blog posts and, you know, other, all the other marketing pieces that we can do because there is such this direct connection and we get to really see, see who that person actually is. Hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned knowing your audience and certainly if you get in front of your audience and and you read their immediate reaction to what you're presenting and you get feedback later on as well, then that really adds to the knowledge of the audience and you can keep uh, keep getting to know them better over time and keep improving your messages over time as well to, to suit them. Great, absolutely. You know, so from a credibility perspective, I think that's really what's front and center, right? Because um, that that person in the audience or, or that larger audience, they really get to see who you are, um, which I think is, you know, sometimes, you know, behind a blog post or, you know, whatever the marketing medium can be, that's not quite there, right? Being in person, it is. Hmm. Now, you just triggered a thought in my mind and you mentioned earlier on about vulnerability and uh, I think it was in a corporate, with a corporate client where they wanted the people to be more themselves in their interaction with their colleagues and, and perhaps their teams. Um, in terms, I mean, there's a lot of talk these days around vulnerability in presentations and so on. What, what are your thoughts on where does that um, 
Or what specifically do you mean? Because if somebody gets up on stage and says, oh, I'm really nervous, I hope I don't mess this up, is that being vulnerable or is that being needy? I think that's being a little bit needy. And that's, <laughs> I know um, for me and for my for my own clients, I recommend don't say it. I think sometimes it then can exacerbate um, your own nerves. Um, and audience doesn't need to hear, right? Just charge away and yeah. uh, and uh, deliver your presentation. And I've, I've been I've had a really very strong positioning around um, the vulnerability piece. And you know, I know that there has been a lot of talk about it lately, and especially a couple of years ago. But however, I I have a very strong feeling as well that there's also professionalism. And so we've got to be very careful about that line of um, how vulnerable we actually are um, to not, you know, go over the line of, um, of being unprofessional. Um, so I think that's something to be very cautious and, and careful about. Hmm. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, uh, I think, I mean, I have this, um, I don't know whether it's a philosophy or a framework or a trick, but you know, the easiest way to be vulnerable, if you've got a strong message, and particularly if that message is around, here's what's wrong with the world, or here's what's wrong with this, this thing in the world, um, you're basically starting off with a mm -hmm. criticism of mm -hmm. something that you have a passion to change. Mm -hmm. And the way I see, you know, that, that you can really easily bring in this vulnerability is to start off with, I used to do that. Yeah. I used to believe yeah. that it was right to do this. So basically your critique, criticism is pointed at yourself mm -hmm. and then you say, and then I realized, mm -hmm. and here's what happened to me. Maybe you share a story where you are humiliated or called out. Um, mm -hmm. And then, then you say, and then I realized, and I had this epiphany. And so you describe your own journey and now you're driven and passionate to help other people make that change without being humiliated the way you were. So I think mm -hmm. that, to me, that's kind of a nice way of doing it without, it doesn't feel unnatural. You do have to share of yourself and um, get over your ego of saying, well, I'm the expert, I know everything. It's kind of like, you know, I was once in a position where I thought this was the right way to do it. And then I saw the light and here's how. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's an absolutely beautiful way to share it. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the... <laughs> I have to laugh about the the nervous one because I often, if I'm doing a presentation somewhere and people come up afterwards, um, particularly like I do Toastmasters and so there's lots of people come to Toastmasters to learn presenting and often when new people uh, are there and I do a presentation, they come to me and they say, oh, I can't believe you weren't nervous at all. I mean, I'm always nervous when I go up there. How, to, how, to, how do you do that? And I say, I was nervous. <laughs> yeah. I was nervous, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that I'm nervous because that doesn't serve you. I'm, I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. It's about me. Although I mm -hmm. did mention earlier on, you know, part of that is that I want to do a good job for my audience. I want to get the message across for my audience because I really care about it. So then there's that nervous energy. Oh, but yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah. And it's exactly what you say. It's because you care, right? You care about your audience. And, mm. you know, I think of over the years, you know, the number of years that I've been in practice, um, you would probably be surprised at, at some of the people of the names that I would share with you that they would tell you that they're nervous. Mm. Most people, most people are. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, I've heard people say, you know, and really well-known speakers and that they say well if you don't feel those nerves at the beginning yeah. that's a bad sign it's a really bad sign yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. that you don't i would say that you don't care enough yeah that's right yeah you're not vested enough in it yeah all right well this is fascinating but i'm just watching the time here so i think it's a good point to move on to the buzz which is our innovation round and it's uh designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers today and inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result. All right, here we go. <laughs> what do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Oh, they have to be curious. You have mm. to be a curious mind. And I look at myself, you know, as I said, uh, here I am in my early 60s and uh, that, that curiosity has not waned at all. Mm. 
Yes, uh, I think I think that's absolutely the secret, the curiosity. And I, I was having a conversation in the last episode um, with uh, Simon Leslie about learning, and you know he he's a lifelong learner. And and I said one of my favourite quotes is the one by Einstein where he said that uh, something like, "The more I learn, the more I realise I don't know, yeah. and the more I realise I don't know, the more I want to learn." So. <laughs> Yeah. That that really to me is is the curiosity, that insatiable curiosity. Yeah, zest for life, and um, and that that's what gives you the ability to to drive to drive your business forward, and to drive it successfully. Hmm. Love it. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? <laughs> Oh, that I would say that. Um, so, along with curiosity, it, it's about um, it's about listening. It's really having ear to the ground um, around what your what your clients need and what your clients want. And I know, you know, and it, and it was a a really easy lesson, you know, with um, with COVID nineteen, you know, rearing its head, you know, a number of months ago. Because you know that wasn't a really is easy listening piece for me around transition. But however, you know when I look back, you know um, past number of years, you know over my um, my work life and you know with my business, um, I had to be really astute to you know what is it that my clients wanted? You know, did they want you know group training? Um, what did, what type of training did corporate want? What you know what what type of training was effective? Um, um, you know, was it, you know, just for individual clients? Um, what did the structure of what I was delivering to them, um, you know, what, what was effective and, you know, really had to have an ear open and listen to the feedback, um, whether it was um, verbal um, or nonverbal, um, I had to be, you know, really astute in listening um, to, to move, perhaps move things in a different way um, if, if it wasn't working or, um, um, you know, make even, um, you know, bigger moves in that direction if it was working. Mm. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, focused on the client again and their needs and which is consistent with your message from earlier about the presentation focused on the audience and then adapting and testing ideas as well. Yeah, trying and testing, always mm. trying and testing. Mm. Okay, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Mm. Favorite resource that I use? Um, well, when I'm on my, uh, on my computer, um, one of the platforms that I love to use because I read a lot is uh, OneTab. Are you familiar with that? With OneTab? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, OneTab. I've got it open here. Right? So the yeah. uh, Chrome extension that collapses all your yeah. all your browser windows because yeah. if you're anything like me, you've got about 50 browser windows open at any given time. Yeah, that's me. Um, and the other one that I use is Asana, and I've been using that for a number of years. Um, I find that so helpful to move pro to move projects along. Um, and for me, I'm a very visual person, so um, Avana, uh, Asana um, suits me quite well. Mm. Mm, yeah, we, we're users of Asana and I recently did an exercise to evaluate some of the new uh, project management tools that have come along and some of those have got some really nice designs, you know, very modern designs. Asana's kind of, well, it's not, it's pretty good actually, but it's just mm -hmm. that because we've been using it for so long, you kind of mm -hmm. get a bit tired of it, I suppose. Um, right. But we did all the analysis and I found that mm, it's probably best we just stick with Asana because uh -huh. it, it still does everything we need. And uh, yeah. Do you use um, Asana with your clients or do you use Asana for project management for yourself? Uh, with some clients, we also use it. Yeah. Yeah. I've started um, trying using it with clients over the past year and it, I've not been that successful at it. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out why. Yeah, mm. because I would love to be able to use it with them um, and have all the resources in one place. But it's making me think that probably perhaps the Santa is not the platform. It might be something else that would be more useful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the challenge is um, for me, and again, thinking of 
the client here, you know, there might be reasons why they don't like using Asana, particularly, I mean, it's a new tool for a lot of them then. Mm -hmm. So that that's always the barrier. But for me, I get hundreds of emails a day. And so if people send me an email, particularly if it's something, hey, can you quickly deal with this? It's urgent. Um, that will tend to get lost in email. Yes. Whereas um, on if if we were on a sign or on a shared project, it's likely to get seen much more quickly. And also, I can share it with my team more easily than I can in email. So if somebody else can mm -hmm. see if there's something that says, "Hey, this is urgent. We need to deal with this." Somebody else can see it and either deal with it if they know how to, or or alert me to it. Yeah, that it's all sitting there in one place and that the, tri mm. you know, the triggers, the alerts are coming out. Yeah. All right. So, uh, well, kind of straight on to the next question, actually. How do you keep a client or a project on track? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's funny. It's, you know, as, as my business has become bigger and, you know, more complex over the years, you know, as I said, I'm at, I'm at a stumbling block right now. Hmm. um how to have everything in one place so yeah that that i'm that i'm working on <laughs> all right okay and finally what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves mm, well it's public speaking of course <laughs> you know to get your get yourself out there and to have your voice heard so that people can see you know the real the real you out there and to, to see you know who that person is you know behind behind the name Hmm. Yeah. Great tip. And um, we've spoken at length about some of the ways to approach that and get better at doing it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Janet. Janice, this has been wonderful. Now, where can people find out more about you and um, learn about your work and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared with us today? Yep. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so they'll find me, you know, under my name. So I'm Janice. I'm an ICE Janice. And last name is Tomich um, without um, an H in the front end. So it's T-O-M-I-C-H. Um, same for my website. That's uh, JaniceTomich.com. All right. We'll have links in the show notes as well so people can click straight through. Now, do you have any parting advice for our listener today? Mm, parting advice. I, I wish that when I had started my business and 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 for the first number of years that I, that someone had told me it's so it's it's good you know to, it, and it's perfectly fine to go out and ask advice of others and garner the advice from them however you have to realize that that advice is coming from their own experience and so you need to deliberate and be really thoughtful about whether the advice that they're sharing with you um, will work for you in, in, in your situation. Mm. That's fabulous advice because um, it, to me, that opens up the opportunity. I mean, people are often afraid of feedback. And to me, that opens up the opportunity of saying, well, I'm going to ask for feedback everywhere. I'm going to get feedback from people because I have a choice of whether I take it on board or not. Um, I can filter it through my particular filter, my particular needs, and and if it comes through that, then I've got a gift. I've got something I can do something with. I can take action on. Or if it's something that I think is just not valuable, then I can choose not to do anything. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So, and I wish that I would have learned that sooner. Because, you know, I, I thought, you know, I'd look at people and sometimes even unsolicited advice and, um, you know, think that they were the sage and they knew it all. Well, they knew it all for them, but it wouldn't necessarily work for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yes, it's always if people say, here's how you do it, um, it's always good to turn that around and say, here's how they did it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. This Perfect. worked for them. <laughs> Exactly. So, yeah, let's take a look at it. Will it work for us? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. Hmm. Sure. Okay, well, finally, Janice, who else should I get on the podcast for a conversation and why? I would love for you to reach out to a, a lovely, whip-smart young woman. Her name is Christine um, Mayston. And um, 
Christine has just now arrived here and I'll, I'll um, send her email address over to you. She's just arrived back here now in Vancouver. She's been away for five years working in the UK on a special project with Harrods. So she is a marketer and she specializes in um, loyalty programs and customer experience. Um, so she has a fascinating background um, in, uh, in, in the work that she does. Mm. Well, that's one of my, one of my hobby topics, the customer experience, customer experience design. So yeah, really looking forward to reaching out to Christine and having that conversation. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for today, Janice, for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously. I've really enjoyed this. You know, we've had lots of back and forth, um, lots of ideas that not only apply to speaking, but generally presentations, online presentations, appearing on camera on online and on podcasts even. So I've learned some tips and um, yeah, all the best for the future and let's stay in touch. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. I hope you really enjoyed that informative and delightful conversation with Janice and that you took something away from what she shared with us today. My takeaway was Janice's framework for constructing a compelling presentation combined with the way to show the real you. Now, I'd love to know what you took away from Janice's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Janice Tomich. That is J-A-N-I-C-E-T-O-M-I-C-H, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Janice Tomich. You'll also find contact information for Janice there, as well as links to her website, her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Janice suggested that we have a conversation with marketer and loyalty program expert Christine Mayston on a future InnovaBuzz podcast episode. So Christine, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast courtesy of Janice Tomich. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got more fantastic guests lined up, including Neil Butler of Untypical and Marcel McCarthy of One Two. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember... Be awesome and keep innovating.